Now, Mike Yardley, with whom I've spoken before, is an eminent historian of terrorism and a psychologist to boot. And I want to talk to Mike now about this issue of security. Mike, thanks very much for joining us. Hi, George. Hi there. Nice to talk to you again. Now, uh, you. I-, I was making the point earlier that in the sea of troubles that we now have as a country, the uh, the detonations of fanatic violence that we saw three times in the course of three months, leading to almost 50 people uh, being killed, leading to hundreds of people being hospitalized and terror sown in the hearts of millions of people in this country. I refer to the Westminster Bridge attack, the Manchester Arena attack, the London Bridge attack. The detonation of that violence has uh, apparently died away and there's not much to show, at least in the Manchester case. For, in fact, uh, also the London Bridge case, there's not much to show in terms of arrests and suspects uh, uh, banged up and waiting trial uh, for what were truly horrific acts. Where, where are we going to go and when's the next one going to happen, Mike? Well, you know, since I went into the army as a kid, essentially, George, came out of the army, went back into the army, went to be a reporter, went to Lebanon, was involved in the war there, went on to Africa, and after that to Afghanistan. I've seen a lot of terror at first hand. And the thing that's always struck me, whether it's been terror across the water in um, Northern Ireland or terror abroad, every time there's an incident, there's this obsession in the media, this hysteria for a so-called security review. I've heard hundreds of secure calls for security reviews, and yet it never works because security isn't the answer to terror. You've got to consider terror at the level of energy, at the level of motivation. For years, I'd knock on the door of the BBC and try and say, well, look, let me talk about this. I managed to get a couple of leading articles into the Times, make a few broadcasts on the BBC, but essentially they do not want to hear this message that terrorism is all about energy. Understand the energies, whether it's left-wing terrorism, right-wing terrorism, radical Islamic terrorism, whatever it might be, understand the energies, and you're beginning to get at the problem. Meantime, I've watched the media conspire in terrorism. I call it death drama. They over they overcover it. But there's nowhere to hide from their coverage. They are increasing the number of psychological casualties. The purpose of terror is to create psychological casualties, not to create physical injury. They want to scare people. So if you repeat, for example, that image of the twin towers and the aircraft a thousand times, that is like increasing the original incident. You are playing into the hands of the terrorists. So what we're trying to do here, I hope, is to try and increase people's understanding. The first thing to say is, look, you are targeted by the terrorists. They want to frighten you. But the best vaccination to that frightening is to actually understand what's going on. There was an excellent article in the Evening Standard the other day by Sarah Khan. Did you read that? No. I thought, I thought that was extremely interesting. And she was saying that really the Muslim community in the UK is in a very difficult position because it is a conservative community, as you've suggested, Mm -hmm. but there are modernizers within it. And actually, they're having a very hard time. Nobody's really supporting them. They're actually no platformed in some places, whereas the people who are radical and very conservative um, are allowed to get their message out. So it was an extremely insightful article. But she said, look, let's be serious about this. Probably something like 40% maybe of the Muslim community in the UK are pretty conservative. That doesn't mean they're radicalized, but it means that they're pretty conservative. As you say, Islam is what it is. And those people, when they see the sort of terrible prejudice, the racism that you see all over Facebook, all over Twitter, you know, it's, it's everywhere now. Imagine what they feel like, and especially imagine what the young people feel like. I mean, where do they go? So these people that are stimulating hatred for Muslims, they are making the problem worse. It is shameful. It is wicked. It is probably criminal. I saw somebody was prosecuted by, um, I think it was Sussex Police recently, for this sort of incitement on Facebook, and, and a very good thing too. Meantime, going back to the wars that you discussed, 
I was in Afghanistan. I was there in the 80s when the Russians were there. I saw how futile the whole campaign was from the Soviet perspective. They never occupied the country, rather like us. They just had a few bases. And they, you know, they, they patrolled, they got attacked, and eventually they left with the tail between their legs. Because the enemy could always come out of the hills, it could go over the border back to Pakistan, it, it could never really be pinned down. A conventional response to that enemy was never going to work. And meantime, it was a sort of Maoist idea of the gorilla fish swimming in the sea of the, the maybe friendly locals. Now, the Mujahideen as was, and you'll remember all the heroic stories we used to get in that era, of course, morphed into the Taliban. Very similar people, same political parties, things like NIFA, the National Independent Islamic Front, all of, the, all of these sort of weird and wonderful parties they had um, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan morphed into the Talib, which, generally speaking, is a Pakhtun, a Pathan entity. And so there are a lot of old tribal rivalries and other rivalries that come out. And so you note the, the, the fight now between ISIS and the Talib, a, a pure power struggle. Um, this situation that we face now, though, I don't see anybody getting a grip of it. I really don't see anyone doing anything that is going to make it better. And in fact, I have to say that doesn't just apply to the terrorist situation. It applies to many national problems. Meantime, I noticed the Corbyn factor, the Farage factor, the Trump factor, Le Pen in France. This is a cry from the heart from ordinary people, however else you might interpret it. But the establishment, the system, isn't misrepresenting them, isn't representing them properly, excuse me. And of course, in a way, terrorism is something to do with that, taken at its gravest extreme. I mean, as you say, the Afghan war was futile, the Iraq war was provocative and morally wrong. How many people did we kill in Iraq? Maybe a million, who knows? We don't really know how many people died there. Do we expect that doing something like that, which enriched some people beyond avarice, is not going to have consequences? Of course it's going to have consequences. So... I don't know. Where do we go from here? I really don't know. I think we need to be doing completely different things to the ones we're doing at the moment. And as you say, the prevent strategy clearly isn't working properly. Um, it's seen, you, you referred to the people involved in it as being seen as Uncle Tom's. I don't know if that's correct, but I, I'm sure there's some truth in that statement. Mike, you are an extraordinarily wise and eloquent man. And the contribution you've just made is frankly, immense. And the fact that you're not regularly on the BBC uh, has to be lamented because you spoke more sense in the last five, six, seven minutes than any of these talking heads that are forever uh, paraded uh, in front of us. I've got to take a break for the news. I'm going to ask your permission and the permission of the producer to ask you to stay on the line so that we can complete uh, as best we can in the hour available the discussion that we've had. But I must take a break for the news. I think, Mike, are you there? Yes, please do, George. Yeah, um, there's there's a here and there's a there. Uh, there are too many people on the left are only concerned with a change of approach there and think fatalistically about here. And there are too many people on the right who think only about here without taking into account how much there affects here. Now, I think essentially that's what we are both agreed on. Uh, I wouldn't, however, conclude that because there is such a difficulty that we can do nothing here. Uh, let me use as a case in point the Manchester Arena atrocity because that uh, was very up close and personal to me. Uh, the, if we had had security at the foyer of the Manchester Arena, a man showing up with a rucksack on his back or a suitcase in his hand, whichever it was, it's not yet clear, which it was, would not have been able to go in with it into the foyer and murder all these people. If the five warnings, five, from the community about this man 
I don't want to even say his name. I spit upon his name and uh, and his face, which is fixed now in my eyes forever. Uh, if If those five warnings had been efficiently acted upon by enough uh, police and enough security service personnel, it, he would have been arrested long ago. His own family reported him. His own imam in Didsbury Mosque reported him. His colleagues in the university reported him. But nothing was done about him. If the cell of Libyan jihadists to which he and his father and his family belonged, had not been harboured in our midst as a matter of deliberate policy by the British government, if that cell had not been freed from their control orders and given their passports back and allowed to travel back and forth, back and forth, to war-torn Libya and peaceful Manchester, this man would not have been able to murder his own uh, school friends, his own university mates, the people that he played football with and whom he was ready to murder. If Boris Johnson had not taken the railings off Westminster Bridge, London Bridge, uh, then the first part of those atrocities at least could have been avoided. A car could not have mounted the pavement and could not have murdered those people. So it isn't true, is it? And I'm sure you wouldn't say that that there's no point in any security issue. Security is necessary, but not sufficient, is really what I hope we can agree on. No, I think we do agree on that, George. You must have efficient, prudent security, and it must be effective. I mean, we need probably more intelligence officers now, mm. and the money for them needs to be found. Yeah. You need <clears throat> prudent physical security based not just on intelligence. You have to have a blanket approach to a degree. But the point is that security will never solve the problem of terrorism. Quite so. Because terrorism itself can always divert if the fundamental energy and motivation is there, which sadly it seems to be. So we do need prudent security. But I do think that there is a danger, particularly that the media becomes obsessed with security. It's a sexy story, if you like, in the wake of tragedy. I mean, that's the, the, the terrible truth of it. There's the idea that somehow maybe technology or something the SAS, who knows what, can save us. And the truth of the matter is, yes, we have to look at security and make it better where we can and have it adequately resourced, but it's not going to deal with this problem in the long term. And that point gets missed. The media is very, very bad at considering the motivation and energies behind terror, but it does conspire with the terrorists by this terrible, hysterical, obsessive repetition after every event, which is, imagine the effect on the average person in our society, particularly young people. I think one of the interesting things that hasn't been considered in all the political analysis is just how depressed young people are about, they feel hopeless. I talk to a lot of them. I talk to everyone. I make a point of trying to talk to them about how they feel, what their issues are. And young people are quite worried about terror. They're worried about not being able to get houses, not being able to get jobs, but their life is not a happy one. And until we start to look at that really seriously, and I don't see the, you know, I certainly don't see the Tories and the establishment doing that. I, I think that they, I think we, we probably disagree on what the right course of action is at the moment with regards to the Labour Party. But I think the Tories have failed the country. I think the Tory establishment, which is essentially landed, landed wealth, big money, I think they have failed the country because they have not addressed that despair adequately. And a lot of the things that we're seeing at the moment, both politically and at the gravest extreme as far as terrorism are concerned, are linked to despair. We've created a society that generates despair.